This presentation is called, Do You Have Scary PowerPoints? So David Forrest noted that PowerPoint can be a powerful teaching tool, but when used poorly, the presentation software can dilute and distract from the lesson you're trying to convey. I think this cartoon really kind of captures this idea of a term you might have heard called death by PowerPoint, where you've been in a presentation and you just, you know, the presenter is just either reading directly off the slides or they have too much going on and it's so distracting that you really just are not able to take in the information that they're trying to convey. This idea of death by PowerPoint has actually been around since 2001. Um, and there's actually a really funny bit from comic Don McMillan from 2008 where the idea of, of death by PowerPoint is really captured well. As you can see, even Scott Adams, the Dilbert cartoonist, has addressed this concept of death by PowerPoint, although he calls it PowerPoint poisoning. What does the research say about using PowerPoint in teaching and learning? Well, actually, a couple of studies have shown that there is no significant change in learning outcomes for students between professors who use PowerPoint and those who don't. However, there is a measurable influence on students' perception in the classes where students, um, where their instructors use PowerPoint versus not. Students feel like they're learning more and that their learning uh, experience is better when professors use PowerPoint but the evidence doesn't actually show that those outcomes measure up. So what are some of the reasons for using PowerPoint? Well, there are definitely some clear advantages. It's great for enriching content and illustrating complex concepts, but it's not good at providing large amounts of information, and that's frequently our fallback. Some of the advantages that have been noticed include producing better visual effects and deeper impressions for the students. It can speed up the amount of information transfer. It can allow instructors or presenters to have greater precision in what they're saying. And it definitely adds greater organization to the lecture as a whole. But the disadvantages are complex. They include the risk of neglect of interaction with students. Because we as professors tend to try and get through that PowerPoint, we have to race through. Sometimes the use of PowerPoint actually makes our lectures into monologues where we are not allowing students to interact with us in any way. In fact, it can actually encourage students to become more passive. So there are several different um, things that have been noted, including that PowerPoint should not be viewed as a replacement for the Blackboard, but rather as an efficient auxiliary medium, medium as Zasbo and Hastings noted in 2000. You still have to monitor students' engagement with your lecture if you're going to use PowerPoint and try to use the slides to stimulate active learning techniques. Jana Hackathorn in the psychology department here at Murray State gave an excellent lightning talk about using lecture cues in your PowerPoints to stimulate discussion and talked about the research that backs up that successfulness of that tactic. So what is actually going on in students' brains when they're sitting there watching you do a PowerPoint lecture? Well, Mayer's Multimedia Learning Theory Principles talks about this a little bit. The multimedia principle is that students learn better from words and pictures than just words. Now, Spatial Contiguity Principle means that when there are words and pictures that are close together, that helps the learning. The Temporal Continuity Principle shows that words and pictures that are presented simultaneously are better than words that are presented successively. So you need to have them on the same slide in order to get the benefit of it. In the coherence principle, extraneous words, pictures, and sounds should be excluded in order to maximize learning. Modality says that students learn better when there's animation and then the instructor narrates what's going on in that animation rather than using animation that is explained by on-screen text. The redundancy principle talks about that same kind of thing that students do better with animation and instructor narration than all three of them. Sometimes you might think, oh, I'm going to animate this, I'm going to talk about it, and then I'm going to give on-screen text about what I say. Um, 
So you want to think about all three of those things together. And then individual differences. Design effects are stronger for low learners than for high learners and for highly spatial learners than for low spatial learners. So these are some of the guiding principles for how we should potentially approach PowerPoint design. So when I give this workshop, one of the things that I do is then I insert this kind of lecture cue. And I have students at this point discuss with a partner. Based on these principles, why might PowerPoint be criticized? And I use this apply now button in order to signify every single time in this slide that students are going to need to do a discussion or activity at this point. I've seen other professors do this where they have a star in every slide that requires an activity. Or they might set it off by a funny picture to kind of alert students into the learning. So since we're doing this kind of as a um, old one-way conversation, um, what I'll say is that when there's slide after slide of full text lacking images, or where we're just reading instead of having complementary images there, we really are um, overloading our students. That makes the whole thing less effective. So the more um, com the more processing, the slower the learning is going to be for the students. So Sweller noted that PowerPoint is effective to speak to a diagram because it presents information in a different form. But it is not effective to speak the words that are written because it is too much load on the mind and increases your ability to understand what is presented. Now a couple of techniques I used here, this is a long quote, but the things I really wanted students to take away from this is PowerPoint's good for diagrams, but it's not effective as a way to read the words that are written. So when I was presenting this in class, I might actually change how I talked about that one in order to increase what was going on. The good news is that using PowerPoint effectively or ineffectively is almost entirely in the power of the professor. But it can be very tough for us because, as Lou noted, we are experts in our fields, so we can kind of suffer from an expert blind spot. It makes it difficult for us to work out what the salient points the students need are. We are often tempted to crowd a lot of superfluous detail into our slides because we think they need to know everything, and that actually is working against us in order, in terms of them understanding the information and making sense of it. So, a couple of uh, studies have looked at student preferences for what they would like to see in PowerPoints. So they said to avoid having too many words in a slide, using clip art, um, having movement, slide transitions, or word animations, or having templates with too many colors, because all of these things can be overwhelming to them and make it harder to, to make out what it is they're supposed to get from the presentation. Do put graphs to increase the understanding of content. They love bulleted lists to help them organize ideas. They really like it when PowerPoints help structure the lecture by having you kind of show where you're going to be going and then including like signposts like, hey, we're moving into this new section or having kind of that transition slide that says, hey, we, we've covered this material, we're going here. And then they like it when we put pictures or graphs in that we then verbally explain, which they find more useful than having the text up there for a written clarification. This can also help make PowerPoints harder for students to understand if they don't come to class. So because they are missing, we have this one key picture that really, you know, demonstrates something and your explanation of it is spot on and really helps it make sense to the students. But if students don't get that explanation, then the PowerPoint doesn't make sense to them. So that can be a, a, a concern for sharing your PowerPoints, which we'll talk about later. The same study kind of looked at what students learn or what when they learn more. So material is presented in short phrases rather than full paragraphs. The professor talks about the information on the slide rather than having students read it on their own, so don't just put it up there and have them read it. Um, they use relevant pictures. Irrelevant pictures actually decrease learning compared to PowerPoint slides with no pictures. So if you are choosing between no pictures or irrelevant pictures, 
I'll choose no picture, but relevant pictures are, great, are best. Um, students learn more when they take notes if the professor is not talking, but if the professor is lecturing, note taking and listening can decrease learning. So kind of keep that balance in mind. Um, and they are given the PowerPoint slides before class, which can be something called guided notes, which there will be a sample of posted along with this video. Other things to remember include um, dividing the information between the visual and auditory modality. So that reduces the likelihood of one system becoming overloaded and minimizing the opportunity for distraction by removing anything like music, sound effects, animations, or background. Um, using simple cues to direct learners to important points or context, such as text size, bolding, italics, highlighting, or shaded boxes can convey the significance of key ideas. And remember, don't put every word that you intend to speak on your PowerPoint slide. Um, keep information displayed in short chunks and then fill in the rest around it. So how do I make my PowerPoints better? Well, the first thing to ask yourself is, what is my purpose? It doesn't always have to be the same every time, though. For example, you could have a lecture outline where you really are just trying to keep students on the same page and stay focused. So that could be one purpose. Another purpose might be a lecture prompt for the instructor. Thinking about the idea of a three by five note card, which is how you maybe used to present. Um, but basically just put it up there yourself as reminders and have a secondary, more detailed notes file or outline that you follow um, with the information that you may have to make sure that you don't forget. But using just the, um, the lecture prompt instead of making it a word by word discussion. You can have, um, one purpose might be as a note-taking aid for students. If you do, you really gotta pay attention to the minimum word count. It's not suited to really long uh, definitions, and then it requires a lot more time for students to transcribe the information. So that can be really frustrating for students. So what you might do instead is use fill in the blank slides where you put um, maybe key ideas or you, you put all the information you want but leave out key ideas or phrases and put big blanks on your slide and have students fill it in as you go. This of course would mean that you are having them print out and bring slides with them or you are providing them with a copy of the slides and that would be something you would need to think about both in terms of um, expense and your time. Sometimes um, the purpose might simply be to create a visual aid to help students kind of lock in the content. Or it could be um, a, used as a method of discussion or a formative assessment tool where you are doing some kind of response like clickers or clickers and you're having putting questions up and then having students vote or, or answer um, in that way. So there can be a lot of different purposes for PowerPoint. And the thing to remember is during a semester, they might not always be the same. You might have some lectures that need to have one purpose and others another lecture that has a different one. So don't always assume that your, your PowerPoints have to be exactly alike because it, there can be benefit to um, making that switch. So another way to make your PowerPoints better is to think about ideally you need one idea per slide. If you're having more than one message or content, you probably want to add another slide. And if you really think about this, then you could end up with lots of slides. So this is where you really got to think about what is most important if you're going to have that one idea and how many slides you can actually get through in your class period time. You might need to break up the information or break down the information in a slightly different way. You really need to consider thinking about your fonts. Um, it is much better to think about the standard and plain fonts like Arial, Verdana, or Times New Roman. Um, sans serif fonts like Arial and Verdana actually read better on PowerPoints, um, and so they should both be considered. It has to be legible for everyone in the room, which is why we recommend that you don't go anything smaller than 24 to 48 points, so that somebody in the back row has an easy time reading it as well. Um, style can be embellished for certain um, um, key points, but for the most part, 
you should be trying to make it easier to communicate, and so you should you know, stick with a couple of unique embellishments during the whole presentation. You also need to think about color. Patterned or photographic backgrounds can be distracting and also can cause it to be more expensive for students to print. Um, severe changes in contrast can make them hard to read. And you may want to consider using orange, red, and green in your template in order to, um, to increase visibility for colorblind students because those can be really hard for them to discern. Let's look at a couple of examples of what this means. Um, this is both bright, and the green and orange would be problematic for a student who couldn't recognize these colors. Um, Microsoft Office has some excellent tools to help you make sure that your PowerPoints are um, accessible to students, and I posted those along with this presentation online. Think about uh, a good mix of colors. Um, it's better to do dark text over a light background or light text over a dark background. You really don't want to have um, bright or light colors over the top of something else. And you also almost always just want to avoid really bright colors, um, particularly yellow, because they just hurt your eyes, period, and cause headaches and can make it hard for your students to actually look at what you want them to see. So that's definitely something else you want to think about avoiding. Another way um, is kind of what we talked about in the student part is phrases, not sentences. Avoid punctu punctuation as much as possible. Um, avoid abbreviations. Um, they can be hard. Students can get tripped up over those abbreviations if they don't know what they are. Might have to feel like they have to look them up. So make sure you've identified abbreviations or key vocabulary at the front of a lecture. Also, just like we say in texting or emails, avoid all capital letters because they can be hard to read. And then try and aim for no more than six lines per slide. And just to give you an example of how this can increase readability, this is that same content with um, a paragraph versus bullets and, no, and a punctuation. So um, think about how easy the first one was to read versus the second one and really aim to do that for your students. So we're back to another application process. And think about, we talked about the fact that irrelevant pictures are bad. So how can we illustrate concepts in creative ways that really help students learn? There was actually a, um, a study done by a Swedish picture sharing firm um, earlier last year. And they were talking about the fact that there are so many overused pictures. For example, if we think about the picture of a partnership, most often people illustrate that by having people, businessmen shaking hands. So think about how many times maybe you have seen that exact thing in a presentation. So right now what I would have students do is think about other ways that they might be able to illustrate the idea of partnership that don't involve two businessmen. After a few minutes for discussion, we would look at maybe the idea of being creative through that imagery, such as great duos throughout history, bacon and eggs, peanut butter and jelly, or Ben and Jerry's. I was clearly hungry when I was starting to think about this. So some things to avoid. Um, when thinking about um, illustrating concepts, um, this Swedish group actually came up with a list of 10 things that are the most cliched um, items in history and, and PowerPoints. So some of these cliches to avoid include cogs, images of people holding hands around a globe, stacked pebbles, thumbs up, archery targets with optional arrows, jigsaw pieces being fitted into a puzzle, a business person poised to run a race, handshakes, rosettes, groups of business people staring intently at a monitor. So all of these things, think about how many times you've used it. I know I'm guilty of doing this several times myself. Um, and think about other ways that you might be able to capture that information without having to use those kind of images. Aaron Weinberg, who makes slide decks for the TED uh, conference, says people need to think differently about photos. 
Frequently in good presentations, photos serve well in a metaphorical or conceptual sense, or to set a backdrop tone. It's less important to communicate actual content with the photos. So you got to keep that in mind as well. Sometimes there are certainly reasons why you would need a regular photo um, that really does is critical to what you're trying to tell your students, but other times it might just be need to make that connection um, for them in their mind so that when they think back to the presentation they might figure out what it is that that clicked for them. So there are a lot of different ways, that, places that you can find images to enhance your message. Most people go simply to Google Images, and that is not a bad place to go. You can actually look for usage rights in order to find things that are free to use. But some other places you might consider are Creative Commons, uh, the Wikimedia Commons, which is affiliated with Wikipedia. Flickr is still a great place to find some more creative pictures. Pixabay um, has a lot of proprietary professional images um, that, pick, that they offer for sale, but there are some free ones. The only thing is you have to download, you can't just link to something. And then the Open Clip Art Library, which has other public domain images that you can freely use. If you think you just maybe want to try some alternatives to PowerPoint, um, some of the things include Google Slides, which is similar but cloud-based and has fewer options for design but doesn't get away from the same inherent PowerPoint problems. Prezi is something that uses one large canvas and allows you to zoom. That can be a little bit distracting to some students. It's also harder for them to print off or go back and review, so something to keep in mind. Uh, there's something called Haiku Deck, which is really interesting. I like it. There's an um, app for iPhone and iPads, and it really forces you to think of only a couple of keywords and the appropriate images that would go through it. So it really streamlines down how much text you can share and the idea of, of what really relates that concept. And then there's another one called Slide Dog, which allows you to combine multimedia files into a presentation. So you might want to try one of those if you're a little tired of PowerPoint. So one of the last big questions that comes to up with PowerPoint slides is, do I post them in Canvas or do I not post them in Canvas? Forrest noted that you know they can be a study aid. Students really like it when you post them in Canvas, but professors worry that it will decrease attendance and make students um, less likely to participate. It also, as we learned, can kind of distract them from note taking. So you de if you are going to post them, um, there's a couple of different strategies you could use. One, communicate expectations up front that, you know, getting the PowerPoints does not mean that you can't attend class because there is no substitute for that. And make your attendance policy enforceable so that you can avoid that. Um, consider creating a secondary um, option. Um, or presentation, the one that you plan to use in class, and then um, maybe just a simple outline one that you can share with students online that doesn't have all of the information that they would get from attending or doesn't have all of your speaker notes that explain what was meant. Or you could create that fill-in-the-blank type PowerPoint and post that in class or before class even, so that students don't get all of the information, they just get a little bit of it and they still need to um, be there to figure out the rest. Um, if you're going to post PowerPoints, be very careful about copyright information that you've embedded, including images, video clips, or quoted material to avoid any kind of um, copyright infringement issue. So that concludes this uh, presentation on PowerPoint. Uh, if you have any questions about using PowerPoint more effectively, there are tons of good resources online that you can get to um, from here. Thank you.